burning fire from the depths of the earth penetrated the crust deep in the sea to create an archipelago in the middle of the Pacific. The people who first saw the archipelago called it Hell on Earth. In this rough and desolate terrain, organisms had to confront Mother Nature's challenges by developing unique strategies. For survival, they had to change and make choices. A case in point is the marine iguana, which is found nowhere else in the world. The cold ocean current creates magically green rainforests on the ashy volcanic archipelago. To human eyes, the organisms here seemed cursed to this hellish enclave. But in this isolated hell, they created their own paradise. This is the story of the survivors at the end of the world. The remote rocky archipelago Charles Darwin visited some 180 years ago consists of 13 large islands and around 100 rocky islands. People call this archipelago the Galapagos. The Galapagos lies on the equator nearly 1,000 kilometers west of the coast of Ecuador. The islands are all volcanic, created by hot lava from deep beneath the earth. The Galapagos is one of the world's most volcanically active regions. There were volcanic eruptions recently on Isabella and Ferdinand Islands to the west. Blood-red lava engulfs the island, threatening life. After a sea of fire, the island covered in hardened lava is rugged and bleak. All living things must find new habitats. The first to lay root between the lava is the cactus. The landscape where the flowing lava meets the sea is forever changing. It's the result of how the power of life responds even to menacing volcanoes. Organisms here have survived thanks to their respective methods of survival. And in turn, they have evolved into species endemic only to this region. The Galapagos sea lion is one such example.
When schools of small fish emerge to the surface, an awe-inspiring spectacle unfolds. They pull their wings back and plunge into the sea like arrows. They are the blue-footed booby, which dive in to hunt in packs. The Galapagos is home to three quarters of the blue-footed boobies on Earth. The blue-footed booby mates when food is plentiful. That's usually between May and December. During mating season, they gather on a remote island away from predators. They do it to court the females. Males dance by pointing upwards their tails and wingtips. When conditions are optimal, two to three eggs are laid and the male and female take turns brooding. It's the worst time to brood as it is the hot season. Between April and May, which is spring in the Galapagos, one can witness the great frigate bird's unique courting ritual. Males inflate the red sac at the throat and use a distinctive sound to attract females. This is a paradise for seabirds that flit between land and water. However, to those confined to land, the lava-covered island is not particularly attractive. They must constantly search for food. Most of the land here is volcanic, so plants are hard to come by for the iguana which are herbivorous. To survive on this archipelago, the land iguana has chosen to feed on prickly cacti. The condensed moisture in the stem also provides clean, salt-free water. But tackling a cactus is no easy feat. This one is lucky though. It has found a half-eaten cactus. It doesn't have to climb high or chew pesky spines. Given the situation, the cacti here have also evolved. They have developed longer spines and have grown taller to keep animals at bay. Iguanas generally live for around 30 years. But in the absence of predators, iguanas in the Galapagos live for some 60 years. And their greatest enemy is hunger.
How did they come to live in such a treacherous place? This was probably not where they originated. Probably from Guayaquil or some other place, but it was the same species. In such time, several years ago, a million of years ago, it was the same species. But at that time, after an evolution process, that iguana began to be a new species. In mainland Ecuador lives a relative of the iguanas of the Galapagos. They live in lush forests and drink clean water. Unlike the iguanas of the Galapagos, the iguanas here look like dinosaurs, with pointy spines and a dewlap beneath their jaw. How do they end up afar in the Galapagos? Land animals were castaways of ancient storms or floods. They were the survivors of a perilous journey over 1,000 kilometers across the sea. Where they found themselves was vastly different from whence they came. Forests were hard to come by, and the only food they could find were spiny cacti. And even then, they must wait patiently for the leaves to fall. When the sun is strong, the broad leaves of the prickly pears provide shade. Therefore, the animals that have most successfully adapted to the Galapagos are reptiles. Reptiles are salt tolerant and can survive for a long time without food or water. While they do not eat much, they must fight and win to secure scarce food resources in order to survive. Under such treacherous conditions, some became pioneers in their quest for survival. they turned to the sea. The marine iguana is unique to the Galapagos. It is the world's only sea-dwelling iguana species. It couldn't have been easy for a land animal to adapt to life at sea. The powerful instinct to survive has transformed them over the years. Their tail has flattened to propel them in the water and their robust limbs and claws allow them to cling to slippery volcanic rocks. Their skin has toughened to withstand powerful waves. They perform a unique ritual before entering the cold sea. Iguanas, which cannot regulate their body temperature, bask in the sun to warm themselves up. As energy builds up with the raised body temperature, some prioritize intimidating their peers over hunting. They bob their head up and down to threaten intruders.
One simply turns away, thus ending the confrontation anticlimactically. Territoriality is probably instinctive of all animals. Now, it should quickly enter the water to find food. Unlike the tranquil coast, the waves are ferocious. The sea is unforgiving to this little fellow. It struggles up onto a rock, catches its breath, and then dives back in. When the waves are strong, the situation is just as difficult underwater. Currents are as strong as hurricanes on land. Marine iguanas feed mostly on red and green algae that grow in cold waters. They chomp on algae using their blunt mouths and densely packed teeth. They can live on as little as some 100 grams of algae a day. The seabed is covered in green. This is why some iguanas left the land and ventured into the sea. Although food is plentiful, they cannot be greedy. Marine iguanas can dive to a depth of up to 10 meters, but it is dangerous to be underwater for more than 10 minutes. A drop in body temperature can paralyze their muscles. Among the organisms that traveled down with the ocean currents from South America, there is a 250 kilogram giant. It is this fellow here. Elephant tortoise, giant tortoise, Galapagos land tortoise. It goes by many names. The first people to set foot on the archipelago called them Galapago, meaning saddle in Spanish, because their shells looked like horse saddles. That is where Galapagos comes from. The tortoises have evolved in different ways, depending on which island they live on. Tortoises that live in dry lowlands have long necks. Thus, they can reach high up to feed on cacti. The tortoise, which arrived in the Galapagos 3.2 million years ago, have diversified into 16 species. All living things on this archipelago have changed their appearances to adapt to their respective environments. Even cacti have become tougher and developed longer spines to ward off animals that might feed on them.
prickly pears here are varied, with some reaching a height of 12 meters. It is very evident that this is a living laboratory of evolution. Fickle weather is one of the reasons the Galapagos has become an archipelago of change and adaptation. The Galapagos has two seasons, wet and dry. In the dry season, from July to December, the highlands are lush, unlike the desolate lowlands. It's hard to believe these landscapes are of the same island at the same time. Why are they so different? Ocean currents hold the key. In July, the warm Panama current moves away as the cold Humboldt current from Antarctica pushes up. And thus, the Galapagos cools down for half a year. As the Humboldt current cools down the air, warm air is pushed upward. Then, mist and winds blanket the highlands. This season is called Garua. Santa Cruz is the second largest island of the Galapagos. The vegetation is lush in the highlands at an elevation of 300 meters. There are craters amid the lush greenery. They are not volcanic vents, but pits formed by the collapse of massive lava tunnels. Small lava caves near the pits prove that this area used to be a volcano. When the thick fog clears and the sun comes out, a jaw-dropping view presents itself. The drizzle and mist during the Gorua season give rise to a dense, humid forest. This is a forest of Scalicia, a tree endemic to the archipelago. Food is plenty for highland tortoises. Their shells have evolved into a dome shape so they can move and rummage through the grass. They live the life of luxury akin to that of the top 1% of humans. It's a world apart from the cactus-ridden lowlands. After feeding, they warm their bodies in the lake. It is to maintain their body temperature against the cold highland air. It is a peaceful paradise here. Once the sun sets, the cold descends.
During the dry season, when the cold ocean current flows, it is over 20 degrees Celsius cooler at night than during the day. Marine iguanas, which are cold-blooded, huddle together at night. It's better where there is a puddle or lake nearby. Water heated by the equatorial sun is a great place for marine iguanas to spend the night. In the morning, as if on cue, the iguanas emerge from the lake. The early risers get the best spots. The iguanas lie side by side and perform their daily rite of sun worship. They turn their flank toward the sun for maximum exposure to the warmth. sand is moving, the position of the iguana is moving too. They need to control how much temperature they receive from the sand, from the environment. If they don't control how much temperature could be warm or, hot or cold, they will die. While marine iguanas rely on sunlight, their movements are governed by the phases of the moon. The gravitational pull of the moon causes high and low tides twice daily. When water recedes during low tide, algae are exposed and the sea becomes shallow. This is a signal to marine iguanas. Some even appear seemingly from nowhere, and they all head to the sea. The way nature works is so simple, yet amazing. The gravitational pull is at its greatest at full moon and new moon, so low tide is at its lowest. The iguanas do not even have to go into the water. Rocks exposed by the receding tide are like buffet tables. Unlike when they have to forage underwater, mealtime is very leisurely. Algae determines the very survival of marine iguanas. Algae grow rapidly here under the strong equatorial sun. They grow back in just two weeks so marine iguanas usually have access to plentiful food. Low tide is awaited not just by marine iguanas, Low tide brings out many tiny creatures from hiding. Crabs are a case in point. Around 100 species of crabs are found in the Galapagos and surrounding waters. They live in diverse areas.
This fellow, leisurely strolling down the beach, is a ghost crab. Ghost crabs use their claws to put sand in their mouth parts, which filter the sand for food and leave behind tiny balls of sand. But this ghost crab is doing something different. It's taking out sand from its burrow and pressing it down with its claws. Researchers say this is a courting ritual by male ghost crabs. These mounds of sand are a form of signal to females. Six hours have passed, and water is beginning to rise. They must return to land before it is too late. Sally Lightfoot crabs are the first to make their way back to land. They cannot swim, but the water level has risen quite a bit. How will they make their way back? Like water striders, they leap lightly across the water, and hence their name, Sally Lightfoot Crab. This marine iguana, which had a late start, is not in any hurry, as it is a good swimmer. Marine iguanas can even dive, so this is a piece of cake. In no time, the tide flows in along with ferocious waves. There is always a greedy eater that waited too long to make its way back. The sea grows more violent and the return trip grows difficult. Its ancestors probably had to confront countless brushes with death on their journey to this island millions of years ago. reached the volcanic rocks. Like a soldier returning from battle, this marine iguana is covered in cuts and bruises. Once arriving at a safe sunlit area, it collapses from exhaustion. It was a brutal battle with the rocks that tore off huge chunks of skin. Marine iguanas do not have predators on land. 
Flies are the biggest nuisance for this exhausted marine iguana. But it does not even have the strength to chase them away. A distinctive trait of marine iguanas is the expulsion of accumulated salt through salt glands. Recently, the separated existence of marine and land iguanas was thrown off. In that area, or in that small island, we have marine iguana and land iguana at the same time in the same place. So they become to be reproduced by themselves and become to have some hybrid. The hybridism here in Galapagos is a species that is mixing between land iguana and marine iguana. On the tiny island of South Plaza, which is only a two hour trek around, a hybrid with the head of a marine iguana and the body of a land iguana was found. What happened to the two species that have been leading separate and distinct lives for 4.5 million years? Marine iguanas, unable to find food, moved into the habitat of land iguanas. Then can the hybrid iguana live both on land and in water? A hybrid iguana are in the land area. Don't swim too much, but they can swim. So they can eat mainly uh, plants and seeds, but not too much algae. Hybrid iguanas have sharp claws like marine iguanas, but they act more like land iguanas. They use their sharp claws to remove spines from cacti and can easily climb tall cactus plants. Navigating the tightrope between isolation and extinction, organisms are still continuing to evolve here. Mysteries of life we have yet to discover still may be lurking here. The pink iguana is a case in point. A new organism was discovered in the Galapagos Isabella Island in 2009. It was the pink iguana. It is still a mystery how they came to be. The Galapagos begins to see more rain starting in January. It is the start of the wet season when temperatures soar. The desiccated land soaks in the warm moisture and gradually turns green. It is the season land animals have been awaiting. In April, which is springtime in the Galapagos, the number of insects soars and they get very busy. The busiest is the carpenter bee. They feed on prickly pear flowers and transport the pollen. Yellow is the carpenter bee's favorite color.
Flowers attract birds and insects with their unique colors, and the birds and insects help plants reproduce. The manzanillo tree, which grows where there is salt water, bears fruit known as the poisoned apple. The fruit and sap is toxic, so humans and animals steer clear. The elephant tortoise of the Galapagos, however, is strangely immune to the fruit's toxin. Thus, it is a food source they can monopolize. The heavens are fair. Unlike the dry season that only provided cacti, food is easy to come by during the six months of the wet season. In the wet season, when water is plentiful, birds too luxuriate. This lake, where the fresh water from the volcano meets the sea, is home to a wide array of birds. Birds that don't seem to belong to the Galapagos call this lake home. The, the flamingos came from original from the Caribbean. They flew a long time ago. Nobody knows exactly when they arrived here. Flamingos feed for up to 12 hours a day. They filter the sediment they scoop up with their beak and eat small shrimp and water bugs. It was probably tough getting to the Galapagos from the Caribbean, but food was plentiful and predators scarce in their new habitat. Thus, they have settled down perfectly here. Unlike other animals of the Galapagos, which are unwary of humans, flamingos, relative newcomers, are still afraid of humans. The evolutionary trajectory is not over for these organisms that migrated, adapted, and made decisions and changes for survival. Even now, they carry on and reproduce to keep on surviving. Continually changing from one form to another is the ongoing tale of evolution.